the New York skyline has changed forever, so too has the world, by the most shocking terrorist attack of our time. Through the Seven Network's worldwide resources, our live and uninterrupted coverage continues. And at 6.30, Today Tonight asks what is next as the world's biggest manhunt begins. Channel 7 suspends all regular programming to bring you every picture and every breaking detail. Exclusive coverage. Live reports. On air now. 7 News. down the stairs we made it to the eighth floor big explosion this is it we're dead people are jumping out the windows i just heard the rumble and then then I'll, I'll, i ran like hell and it, it was pitch black you could hear chunks of concrete falling all around you oh. anybody need a doctor it seemed like it wasn't even real oh, yeah. don't have oxygen <laughs> a special seven news presentation with frank warwick and Kay mcgrath Good evening, everyone. We now continue our 7 News live coverage of the terrorist attacks in America. Over the next hour, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, detailed explanations of what happened and how the world is responding. And at 6, a special edition of 7 News. We begin with how the devastation began. Those amazing, unthinkable pictures of the destruction after the first hijacked plane, an American Airlines passenger jet, slammed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. NBC's Stone Phillips opens our coverage. Today, the unimaginable happened. At the start of a busy workday, New Yorkers heard an explosion, then looked up to see a symbol of America's economic power, one of the World Trade Center's twin towers billowing smoke and flames. Yeah, the glass, just flames exploded out the front of the uh, World Trade Center, and glass flew everywhere. Minutes later, literally from out of the blue, an even more horrifying sight. A jetliner bearing down on the other tower. It was a direct hit. A second airplane, a 727 just ran into the building. Before the hour was out, the symbol of American military power, the Pentagon, was also in flames. It too apparently the target of a new weapon, a passenger jet hijacked and turned into a guided missile. Across the country, shock, sorrow, fear, outrage, and the realization that America was under attack. About 8.45 this morning, the sky over Manhattan was clear following a night of violent thunderstorms. In the city's financial district, the very heart of American commerce, thousands of workers were already at their desks. Moments later, in the upper reaches of the 110-story North Tower, sudden impact. As Matt just mentioned, we have a breaking news story to tell you about. Apparently, a plane has just crashed into the World Trade Center here in New York City. One second after the sound started, there was gray smoke and what looked to be like confetti flying all over the place. Fire and death above. Confusion below as some 10,000 people streamed out of the building. There was a couple of, a lady had a big gash in her head, so it was people stamping one, one over top of another. Witnesses reported a horrifying scene. Desperate people jumping from the burning skyscraper. Bloody clothing and body parts scattered on the streets below. As emergency crews rushed to the southern tip of Manhattan, the immediate thought, could it really be happening again? In 1993, the same building was hit by a truck bomb, Islamic militants hoping to topple the one tower into the other. Six people died in that attack, and 1,500 were injured. But within the first minutes today, it was clear that the toll this time would be much higher. Then, at 9.03, less than 20 minutes after the first strike, with police and rescue personnel still scrambling to respond, this... many people in the building... Oh, another one just hit! Something else just hit. A very large plane just flew directly over my building, and there's been another collision. Can you see it? I can see it on this shot. Live cameras trained on the first stricken tower captured another huge explosion. This one on the south tower. Only this time, the attack was documented. This indelible image to be replayed again and again, seared into the American memory. 
and here it comes right there. An American Airlines 767 with 92 people on board hijacked on its flight from Boston to Los Angeles, becoming the implement of mass murder. The impact was devastating, the airliner punching through the skin of the huge tower, another rain of glass, concrete, and terror. It's like this unbelievable ball of fire, and the whole street, which is now awake, and everyone's like, whoa. People start crying, people start running. It was now clear that this was no accident. The first tower had also been hit by a hijacked passenger jet, a United flight that had also taken off from Boston, bound for L.A. The attacks left New York virtually paralyzed. Tunnels and bridges linking the city shut down, subways closed, telephone lines jammed, cell phones overloaded as frantic callers tried to contact loved ones. At 9.30, President Bush in Florida to talk about education addressed a nation reeling and in need of reassurance. Uh, today, we've had a national tragedy. Uh, two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center in an apparent terrorist attack on our country. But even as the president pledged to hunt down and punish those responsible, another attack, this one even more audacious. The target, the Pentagon. Another American Airlines jet bound for Los Angeles had been hijacked, this one taking off from Washington's Dulles Airport. It was another direct hit. NBC's Pentagon correspondent Jim Miklaszewski suddenly found himself on the front lines of a war that had come home. I don't want to alarm anybody right now, but apparently there, it, it felt just a few moments ago like there was an explosion of some kind here at the Pentagon. 9.43 a.m. With concern that the White House could be a target, President Bush boarded Air Force One bound for a special secure command post at a military base. At 9.49, the Federal Aviation Administration announced it was shutting down the nation's air traffic. In a world turned upside down, hundreds of passenger planes crisscrossing the country were now potential terrorist weapons. The Federal Aviation Administration ordered all airports closed, and all planes which were in the air were directed to land at the nearest airport. This morning, on a scale beyond belief, Americans experienced what it's like to feel truly vulnerable, to realize when someone is willing to die for a cause, we are all potential targets. As the emergency crews in New York rushed to the scene of the World Trade Center crashes, more devastation was to come. The two towers collapsed, debris crashing down on the streets below. Here's Stone Phillips again. While the nation's intelligence community ran down possible suspects and tried to assess whether more attacks were imminent, Rescue workers in New York and Washington confronted a disaster of immense proportions. In New York, local hospitals began filling up, urgent calls going out to every available surgeon and nurse, long lines of people outside waiting to donate blood. There's a war zone. Why do we it's go up the bus? Unbelievable. The unbelievable. And still, there was worse to come. At 9.59 a.m., the Trade Center's South Tower, the building that took the second hit, began to crumble. It was almost incomprehensible. In a matter of seconds, the skyscraper collapsed and was gone. Suddenly, we hear, you know, like the security say, everyone get out now, now, everyone run, 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 run for your life. NBC producer Shahar Baran was there with a home video camera. A bunch of women just standing there, shocked. By then, the whole building sort of implodes. It just go goes like this. And you see like a side of the building, and then it goes. And there's this ball, this of silver yellow ball sort of heading towards you, kind of in slow motion. You can't figure out what to do. People are starting to run like crazy. Then at 10 a.m., news of another passenger plane in trouble. Someone on United Airlines Flight 93, traveling from Newark, New Jersey to San Francisco, called 911 and reported a hijacking. Then an explosion and silence. The plane crashed here, some 80 miles outside of Pittsburgh. There were 45 people on board. So far, three passenger jets used kamikaze style, and a fourth that might have been. 266 people on board killed, 
The death toll on the ground still unclear. Then, at 10.30, another sickening sight. The tower still standing, following its twin, collapsing, vanishing in a cloud of smoke. <laughs> By 11 o'clock, the sense of alarm had spread across the country. Troops standing guard as national landmarks were shut down. Fighter jets actually patrolling the skies as the last airborne passenger planes rushed to safety. 1114, uh, officials trying to manage the disaster, struggling to describe it all. Um, first of all, Chief, do we have any idea of how many people are in there? We have no idea. Now, as you know, it was pretty much rush hour time that this took place this morning, so the numbers we don't know yet. We how tried many? to get almost everybody out that we could uh, early on. 10,000 people in each tower would typically be in there on a normal business day. And we get about another 5,000 visitors during the course of the entire day. Mm -hmm. So by 8.30, 9 o'clock, the building should have been full. And New Yorkers were struggling, too. And now they both collapsed. There's no more World Trade Centers. At 11.42, another plane from Boston declared an emergency. Fearing a bomb on board, it landed in Cleveland. Soon, all planes in Canada, as well as the U.S., were grounded. The borders with Mexico and Canada were sealed, and Major League Baseball announced the cancellation of all games scheduled for today. At 1.12, President Bush, at Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana, again spoke to the nation. Freedom itself was attacked this morning by a faceless coward, Earth. and freedom will be defended. Earth. I want to reassure the American people that full, the full resources of the federal government are working to assist local authorities to save lives and to help the victims of these attacks. Make no mistake, the United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. Moments after his speech, the president reboarded Air Force One for a then undisclosed location. Meanwhile, in New York, an army of rescue workers and volunteers from the city's building trades and other unions made their way to the wreckage of Lower Manhattan, seeking the injured and dead. You guys going back? Yes. It's our job. You worried about that other tower? Personally, I am. I got fellow officers that might be trapped. Trying to be a hero, but I think if you were in this position, you'd do the same thing. Those civilians who could made their way by foot across the Brooklyn Bridge, as New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani called for calm in a city that was more shell shocked than terrified. And I'd ask the people of New York City to do everything that they can to cooperate, not to be frightened, to go about their lives as normal. The mayor's news conference gave the first hint of just how high the casualty count could be. There are over 1,000 rescue workers, probably about 2,000 that are deployed, trying to get into the buildings, trying to find people, trying to search for people. The governor and I spoke a couple of hours ago. And the governor has deployed the National Guard to relieve them because our, our people are going to need reinforcements pretty, pretty soon. Just before 3 p.m., President Bush landed at Offutt Air Force Base outside of Omaha. From an underground bunker at the Strategic Air Command base, he convened a National Security Council briefing. As 4 o'clock approached, the President's spokesperson, Karen Hughes, briefed reporters back in Washington. The Secretary of Defense remains at the Pentagon, and the Secretary of State is en route back to Washington. 5.21 p.m., even as people around the country struggled with the enormity of today's events, a third building at the World Trade Center, damaged by this morning's attacks, collapsed. Um, they, they advise us to leave because we have... Oh, my God. Look behind us. Please pan in this way, please. Be careful of your baby. This is it. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. No. Fortunately, the building with more than 40 floors had been evacuated. But once again, the concrete canyons of lower Manhattan were filled with the sounds of sirens and the sight of people fleeing for their lives. At 8.30, the president, now back in Washington, addressed the nation from the Oval Office. Today, our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. 
The victims were in airplanes or in their offices, secretaries, businessmen and women, military and federal workers, moms and dads, friends and neighbors. The president focused on America's strength as a nation. Our military is powerful and it's prepared. He also issued this warning. The search is underway for those who are behind these evil acts. I've directed the full resources of our intelligence and law enforcement communities to find those responsible and to bring them to justice. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. Tonight, search and rescue efforts continued at the Pentagon and in New York City, where the Twin Towers once stood, a hole in the skyline an eerie glow and the realization of just how much was lost on this terrible, terrible day. Relatives of those aboard the doomed passenger planes have told how they received calls from their loved ones in flight. They feared for their lives as the hijackers took control and on the ground there was panic. Please, please. Shocked and grief-stricken, the relatives of those aboard the hijacked flights rushed to the airport where authorities quickly took them to private rooms. Grief counselors from the Salvation Army joined airline personnel in trying to comfort the families of the passengers. It's just to be there and to say to them, we are here and we'll do whatever we can do to help you through this trauma and this pain. The first plane to crash into the World Trade Center, American Airlines Flight 11, was bound from Boston to Los Angeles, piloted by 52-year-old John Oganowski. This afternoon, his brother spoke to reporters. I ask all of you for your prayers, for as I refer to him as Brother John. And I ask you to also pray for our whole country today. Among the well-known passengers on the hijacked planes, the producer of the TV series Frasier, David Angel and CNN commentator Barbara Olson, wife of U.S. Solicitor General Ted Olson. She reportedly called her husband twice on a mobile phone to tell him her plane was being hijacked, that the crew and all the passengers were being herded to the back of the aircraft. And on United Flight 93 from Washington to San Francisco, one of the flight attendants, C.C. Myers, also used a cell phone to report that hijacking to her husband, a policeman in Fort Myers, Florida. By midday in Los Angeles, FBI personnel were swarming over the airport checking for possible bombs, but none were found. As a precaution, police and the FBI ordered the airport evacuated. We're evacuating all terminals and we're stopping traffic all over. An eerie scene at Los Angeles International tonight, the airport completely empty. Right now in New York, up to 2,000 emergency workers are searching the rubble for survivors. Already, they've pulled at least two people out alive, and our reports, more who've been trapped inside, have been calling for help on their mobile phones. Here's the latest on the search for life. They have had a miracle of miracles here tonight. Two Port Authority workers were pulled alive from the rubble and taken to nearby hospitals. At this moment, we cannot say the condition that these men are in, but we can say it was... It was a source of great uh, joy for the rescue workers, for the firefighters, when they were able to pull those men out. It is an unbelievable scene. People have been describing this that is much like a war zone. That is no exaggeration. It's hard for the cameras to capture the devastation that you see when you were right there in the middle of what was the World Trade Center. And when you look around and try and imagine where the World Trade Towers were, they are no more, Tom. It is just a shell. There are skeletons. There are fire crews who are hosing down the smoldering remains and saying that they are literally digging through the rubble, hoping that they will find more people alive. There is a staging area, which is only one block from ground zero, if you will. We got there as well. That is where the firefighters are actually devising plans for how they will systematically go through each and every inch of this area. There, we have seen a whole uh, corridor, a caravan, if you will, of emergency crews that are still coming into this area, and there are dump trucks that are being brought into the area, as well as excavators, so that they can literally plow through this rubble. But they're, they're going to try and take some of this out, some of the 
the rubble, some of the, the wreckage that has come from this building when they collapsed. And they've also, I should tell you, been hosing down the streets try, to try and make it a little bit easier for everyone to breathe, and particularly for those emergency workers down there in Ground Zero. A special hotline has been set up for Australians concerned about friends or relatives in the United States. The numbers to call are 1800 002 214 or 1300 555 135. Now the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs has an extra 100 staff to take calls but they are overloaded. Everybody is urged to be patient and persevere. Somebody will take your inquiry as soon as possible. Those numbers again for the 24 hour hotline 1800 002 214 or 1300 555 135. Well, for medical teams, it's been a day of heartache and danger. Dr. Mark Heath was one of the hundreds of doctors involved in the New York rescue effort. I live. It's coming down on me. Here it comes. I'm getting behind a car. This is the car I hid behind. It saved my life. There's all these noises. I think it, I don't know what it is. They say someone needs help. Yeah, Mike! Mike! Mike, come over here! Yeah! Anybody need a doctor? Don't have oxygen. Hey. Hello, Doc. Hey. That guy needs some oxygen. If someone can share it with him. 10-4. Thanks. Highway. You know, but I don't want to get too much closer because the more buildings have come down, then we're not going to help anybody. All right. I think we should. Yeah. Let's just. Yeah. Okay. Let's just, yeah, okay. Let's just wait right here. Let's just station up right here. Okay. All right. Doc. Why don't we set up? We just heard another explosion. They're handing out gloves and masks. Consensus is, it's too unsafe to go in there. Well, that was Dr. Mark Heath. NBC reporter Ann Thompson was also in downtown New York as the skyscrapers fell. This is her first-hand report. A direct hit that shattered New York City's confidence. Well, as soon as the first building collapsed, everybody made a mad dash to, uh, to just take cover. And everybody just started running. I just happened to duck right into the post office. As soon as we got out of the train station, people were screaming and crying and yelling and... It was just total chaos, and the bottom of our building was blown out. For me, Ground Zero, Fulton, and Broadway, about two blocks from the World Trade Center, just as the South Tower crumbled. Hollywood could never imagine something like this. A tidal wave of smoke and debris came roaring down Broadway. I was standing on, at the corner of Fulton and Broadway. I ran into a building, ran between a column and a building at 195 Broadway and pushed my face and my body into that building. For what seemed like five minutes, I was pelted with all kinds of debris. I crouched down, was coughing, trying to breathe. You couldn't get any air. The, the air was so full of smoke and dust. 
When it finally settled, I stood up. My glasses were covered with dust. Hours later, I'm still covered with dust. The building that I was in front of, 195 Broadway, the doors were gated shut. They opened the doors, let us in, and inside we were finally able to breathe. It wasn't easy. My eyes were filled with dust. My mouth was filled with dust. We, I was choking. The people I was with were choking. It was just absolutely horrific. All I could think of was, this is war. I just heard the rumble, and then, then a, a, I ran like hell, and there was a large wind coming. Down here, panic. Survivors flee by whatever means they can, fearing more destruction at any moment. At 10.30, I tried to leave the building, but as soon as I got outside, I heard a second explosion and another rumble and more smoke and more dust. I ran inside the buildings, the chandelier shook, and again, black smoke filled the air. Within another five minutes, we were covered again with more silt and more dust. And then a fire marshal came in and said we had to leave because if there was a third explosion, this building might not last. Everyone, please clear the corner. Palpable fear as people run through the streets, choking on dust and debris. Come on, let's go, let's go. We were, saw the building come down. We all ran and the walkway held up to save like 40 or 50 of us that were right there. We were buried there and then uh, cops shot out windows in the next building. It was the only thing that was in front of us was of, like these one inch windows. The streets of the financial district covered with debris, in some cases ankle deep. Cars on fire, cars just turned by the force of the explosions. It was like something no one had ever seen. Panic, like smoke, heads uptown. Officials ordering precautionary evacuations of some of New York City's landmarks. This is an orderly evacuation of 30 Rockefeller Plaza. On the street, anxious commuters trying to call home, cell phone service dead. At Grand Central Station, travelers desperate to get out of the city. It's going to take a long time, but you're going to see Mama and Papa today, okay? Outside the station, a surreal scene. People buying postcards of the Twin Towers that no longer exist. As the day wears on, witnesses who survived the attack now face a new horror, searching for missing friends and co-workers. We can't account for all of our employees. We have, we're just in a, in a state of shock. The biggest, busiest city in the world, the attack revives fears of the 1993 bombing. Suddenly, nowhere in the financial district seems safe. Did you ever think this could happen again? No, I really didn't. I lived through the first one. After a tragedy so great, tonight a city comes together, searching for safety and comfort. And Thompson on the streets of New York. Authorities are still a long way from working out just how many people were killed in the attacks. But there is a report tonight from our American affiliate network NBC that as many as 800 people died in the Pentagon attack alone. And that estimate appears likely to rise. Here is how that attack unfolded. Yes, sir. Oh, everybody that way. Help me get all these people across the street, please. Moments after the attack on New York, the chaos spread to the nation's capital. I saw what looked to be um, maybe a 20-passenger corporate jet, no markings on the side, coming in at a shallow angle like it was landing right into the side of the Pentagon. And then a huge fireball, perhaps um, five times the height of the Pentagon. The terrorist target was the nerve center of the United States military. <laughs> An explosion ripped through the building that since World War II has symbolized America's power. And we heard this boom, the building shook, the ceiling tiles fell out of the ceiling and we ran out. We kind of dazed, grabbed our hard hats, ran out and there was just smoke. People were screaming, run, what is it, what is it? Let's roll! Get on the other side! As firefighters rushed to put out the flames, America learned that the Pentagon had indeed taken a direct hit not from a corporate jet, but from another hijacked plane, American Airlines Flight 77, en route from Washington's Dulles Airport to Los Angeles. 58 passengers and six crew members were aboard. There may have been as many as 100 more people killed or injured inside the building. Dozens were rushed to area hospitals, yet to be accounted for others that may still be left in the smoldering rubble. Here in Washington, D.C., we are at threat condition Delta. 
Washington, D.C., now in the crosshairs of terrorism. The military was ordered to its highest state of alert. And at the White House, the Secret Service received a credible threat of a terrorist act. You've got to be off the grounds and inside the building. A fourth hijacked plane that crashed 80 miles outside Pittsburgh is believed to have been headed for an attack on Camp David, the presidential retreat in the mountains of Maryland. The president wasn't in town, but Vice President Cheney was. He and key aides were whisked out of the West Wing and into a secure location, while other White House staffers were evacuated under the watch of Secret Service agents armed with machine guns. We've had some reports about intrusions of airspace, which uh, caused us to be uh, concerned enough to recess the House of Representatives uh, subject to the call of the chair. At the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue at the U.S. Capitol and Supreme Court, lawmakers and justices were forced from the seat of American democracy. I think in a sense it is unfortunately a unique experience in American history. And I characterize it as a man who lived through World War II as a young sailor at the end of the war. It's another Pearl Harbor for this country. By 10 a.m., all federal offices were closed, sending the government's entire workforce into the clogged streets to try to make their way home. For tourists, museums and monuments were shut down as well. Washington was in a frenzy. Hospitals in emergency mode, roads shut down, bridges closed, fighter jets patrolling the skies. The mayor declared a state of emergency. ...that all of our emergency agencies are fully deployed to meet any emergencies that might arise. The Pentagon's functioning. It'll be in business tomorrow. What kind of world do we live in? This is terrible. It's just awful. Tonight, Washington is a ghost town. This is the Memorial Bridge, normally crowded with traffic. Yet the attack has succeeded in shutting down the capital of the United States and left Americans wondering, how could it have happened in this of all cities? And of course, one of the big questions is, questions is who was responsible? U.S. authorities have a likely suspect who was already their most wanted man. Terrorist leader Osama bin Laden is believed to have been responsible for a long list of attacks against American targets around the world. An attack on America coordinated with military precision. Four planes, split-second timing, penetration of airports and airspace, no warning. They can destroy buildings, they can kill people, and we will be saddened by this tragedy, but they will never be allowed to kill the spirit of democracy. They cannot destroy our society. They cannot destroy our belief in the democratic way. The first question tonight, is it over? The terrible answer, despite billions spent on U.S. intelligence, the nation's top experts do not know where or when terrorists will strike next. The problem is, uh, that uh, they are hard to penetrate. Uh, they are located in places that we're very hard pressed to, to get any kind of information out of. And as hard as our agencies have tried, they've had some success. You don't hear about that. We only hear about the failure. Who could have done this? Before today, the worst failure, the attack on two U.S. embassies in Africa three years ago. Again, perfectly timed, no warning, 224 dead. The alleged mastermind, America's most wanted terrorist, Osama bin Laden. Bin Laden also involved, U.S. officials say, in helping the man convicted of bombing the World Trade Center, Ramzi Youssef, nine years ago, by protecting Youssef before and after that attack. Last winter, CIA Director George Tenet told Congress that bin Laden is capable of multiple attacks with little or no warning. Osama bin Laden and his global network of lieutenants and associates remain the most immediate and serious threat. Bin Laden's alleged millennium plots planned attacks on three tourist areas in Jordan frequented by Americans, on Los Angeles International Airport, and on a U.S. destroyer in Yemen, all foiled. But six months later, terrorists do strike successfully, ram another destroyer, the USS Cole, killing 17. In June, bin Laden brags on this home video of killing U.S. sailors, a remarkable tape made to recruit more terrorists against America. And just three weeks ago, a warning to a London newspaper, allegedly from bin Laden's group, that he was targeting America again. I think it is a dilemma for the United States now. I believe the only thing is you know, to, to uh, revise their policies, to uh, look at what's happening, why, for example, the anti-American sentiment is very high in the Middle East and in the Muslim wars. How could this happen? Only from a massive intelligence failure. But in this case, at least there will be some evidence. The good news is that 
the uh, uh, hijacking four airplanes is a very complicated operation. Even hijacking one is complicated. And they will have left some trail behind them. They will have had to have checked in. They will have had to have purchased tickets either under their name or alias names. Well, while most of the world has reacted with horror, in some places people are actually dancing in the streets. There are Palestinian groups in particular that believe America had this coming. These Palestinians in East Jerusalem today delighted at the bombings and American loss of life, offering cakes and sweets, calling out God is great. Thousands more celebrate in other West Bank towns until Palestinian police disperse them. The Palestinian leader, however, stunned and sympathetic. We are completely shocked, completely shocked, unbelievable. But the voice of the street reflects anger at America's role, especially in Israel and Iraq. We should show America that uh, uh, they, uh, sh they should learn and uh, they should know what is, uh, what is to attack somebody like Iraq. It should be more. <laughs> and many Arabs furious at American support for Israel. This man holds up an American-made bomb part fired by American-made aircraft used by Israel. American support for Israel, some believe, makes America a legitimate target for terrorism. Many also angry at years of almost daily American bomb attacks against Iraq, which didn't stop with the end of the Gulf War a decade ago. And U.S. troops still in Saudi Arabia. Osama bin Laden, the prime suspect in today's terror attacks, angry at American support for what he calls the tyrannical government of Saudi Arabia, his homeland, and for America's close ties with Israel. In almost a year of unrest, more than a dozen Palestinian suicide bombers and other attackers have killed 170 Israelis, while Israel has killed more than 570 Palestinians, a conflict that always threatens to suck neighboring countries into the fighting. Israel tonight called for an international war against terrorism. The fight against terror is an international struggle of the free world against the forces of darkness who seek to destroy our liberty and our way of life. Today, the leader of Hamas, the Islamic militants who send most suicide bombers against Israel, called on America to change its policies. Sheikh Yassin said America is behind injustices in many parts of the world. But then he said Hamas doesn't support attacks against civilians. Back to New York, and before this attack, the Trade Center towers were among the world's most renowned pieces of architecture. In this NBC report, the man who oversaw their construction gives some insight into why these buildings came down. Hyman Brown was the project engineer on the Twin Towers, the man on the ground in charge of making sure the buildings were built right, the way it was designed. There was a lot of pride in it. Uh, and we were doing something that hadn't been done before. But no one ever considered any types of forces like this. Brown, who spent six years building the towers from day one in 1966, says the planes didn't cause the towers to collapse, but rather the fire and tremendous heat that exposed the steel superstructure to forces it could not withstand. Structural steel is fireproof to last between one and two hours, which it did and then steel melts. Each tower was built around a central core. That core kept the building up, supporting the tower's so-called dead weight. Oh but when God. steel melts, according to Brown, like dominoes, it falls. Brown says oh the towers God. were built to withstand 200-mile-an-hour hurricanes, the 100-year storm, the worst nature could dish out. But he says an airplane crash never oh entered anyone's God. mind. Still, it appears the outside columns made of prefabricated steel absorbed most of the energy from the planes and may have kept the two towers from collapsing oh immediately. University of Colorado engineering professor Stein Stuhr thinks the energy from those large planes would be equivalent to a medium five or six Richter scale earthquake. As the airplanes came in and hit, energy was absorbed tremendously. Some of that core may have been damaged tremendously and maybe this was part cause to this implosion. The way the towers collapsed seems similar to pictures we've become accustomed to watching as old buildings like the Kingdom in Seattle are taken down with explosives. Well, the World Trade Center was once the world's tallest building, 110 stories, but just how tall was that? This will give some idea. The skyline of Brisbane is dominated by the white building Central Plaza One, 
Opened in 1988, it stands 42 floors above Queen Street, a height of 174 metres. The World Trade Centre Tower 1 towered 414 metres above Manhattan. The 208 lifts in it and in Tower 2 carried tens of thousands of people to their offices each day. Around 50,000 people, roughly the population of Rockhampton, worked in the two buildings in over 400 businesses. So, what are the ramifications of the attack? Joining us now from Parliament House is Premier Peter Beatty. Mr Beatty, the key question, I suppose, must be, is our security experienced enough to guarantee the safety of our city during the Commonwealth Heads of Government conference that's coming up in just three short weeks? Frank, the answer to that is yes. As you'd expect, we have one of the best police services in the world, and they have been working very closely with federal authorities. And there are things like risk assessment, they determine the risk, and there's an appropriate response. There's always been an opportunity to upgrade security depending on need, and that's obviously happening now. But if the USA can be caught napping, Mr Beatty, a country on constant alert for terrorism, how can you be so confident? Well, obviously, Frank, there are differences. To begin with, the US is not a member of the Commonwealth, so the US will not be at Chogham. That's the first thing. The second thing that's important is this. We can't kowtow to terrorists. If we were to cancel a meeting, for example, and that is obviously a matter for the Prime Ministers and others to determine, but if we were, then where do we stop? Do we cancel Queensland Parliament, Federal Parliament, Congress, the British Parliament? I mean, this is all about democracy. Democracy needs people to meet to resolve issues. Terrorists can't be allowed to win. If they do, then it's the end of democracy. Well, if Chogham does go ahead, is it not possible that the Queen's visit may have to be aborted, purely in the interests of her personal safety? Well, Frank, all those things need to be evaluated, and they are. I'm signalling that we are still prepared to hold Chogham, and that's because we have to send a clear signal to those who are prepared to murder to try and get their way that democracies will thrive and need to be strong. The second thing, of course, is that their issues I'll discuss with the Prime Minister. I had a discussion with John Anderson, the acting Prime Minister, today. We've met with the Chogham organisers, the federal body, the state, the police. Preparations and considerations are being put in place. I'll discuss those matters with the Prime Minister when he returns from overseas later in the week. Has your office received many calls today suggesting that Chogham should be abandoned? Yes, we've also had calls saying that we shouldn't kowtow to terrorists and in the interest of democracy it should go ahead. So we've been getting both views, Frank. But clearly we need to assess all these things. I just want to make the point again that the US is not a member of Chogham. But I do want to add that I think I'm like all Australians, I'm stunned by this insanity. But we have to make certain that the lunatics don't win, Frank. Mr Beattie, uh, most of us, I suppose, have experienced some sort of taste of the disruption that our city will have to endure during Chogham, during the, the rehearsals and practices. Does this mean uh, the American horror will, will bring an even tougher clamp down our movements on our streets and perhaps in our skies? No, but what it does mean that the appropriate security measures have already been put in place. People have seen the Black Hawk helicopters and all those preparations. There was always a capacity to upgrade security and those issues are now being pursued. But as you saw with the Goodwill Games, Frank, there was always security measures and some closures. We will obviously have a more sustained security position at Chogham. But all the work that needs to be done has been done. We have one of the best police services in the world and it's discreet. And, but no one should misunderstand that discretion. That discretion means it's there, it's solid, it's professional, and it does provide good security. You see, Frank, if we say every time terrorists behave in a way like these people have, that we'll cancel a meeting or the Queen won't come, where do we stop? I mean, democracy is a very fragile flower. It's got to see sunlight. If members of parliament can't meet, if leaders can't meet, then that's the end of democracy. Mr Premier, thank you very much for your time. Thank Kate. you, Frank. Kate. Well, Queensland woke to the horror of this disaster with a full-scale emergency at Brisbane's International Airport. A United Airlines flight heading to Sydney from Los Angeles was diverted after its crew raised fears about a suspicious group of passengers. Just after 5am, United Airlines Flight 815 brought the terror of this tragedy to Brisbane's tarmac. Emergency crews lit up the runway. The 747 en route from Los Angeles to Sydney was diverted. Passengers were told there was a technical hitch. Then came horrifying news of the terrorist attack. 
The captain actually said, um, I think his words were, there are a few times in your life when you remember exactly where you're at, and this is one of those times for myself. A few passengers shuffled out soon after the safe landing, still trying to come to terms with the unimaginable. There's no World Trade Centers. There's none. Yeah, they both left. They're both gone. Wow. But most of the United Airlines passengers faced a long wait in customs this morning where each one was interviewed and their luggage thoroughly checked. They were just asking us what, uh, how long we'd been in America, um, where we'd been. Police later revealed a far more sinister reason for the plane's diversion. As many as five Guatemalan men were being questioned amid crew claims they'd been acting suspiciously during the flight. Oh, there was a man with a computer on that plane. That was um, the crew's concern. Police won't confirm what equipment was seized or reports that the man was playing a computer game featuring a plane crash. The news stunned passengers. Hey, you know, we had a nice conversation. <laughs> he didn't indicate to me he was a troublemaker. Titan security gripped the airport, as did fear. Excuse me, sir, just wondering, were you playing a holiday in L.A.? No, no, we're off to uh, Hong Kong. <laughs> no way, we're going to the States, thank you. The four Los Angeles-bound flights scheduled to leave Australia today, including one from Brisbane, were cancelled. Passengers eager to return to loved ones, now in a frustrating holiday. Pattern. If we could go home, I think we would, yeah. Kim Scubras, 7 News. Security was stepped up at Port Douglas Mirage Resort as soon as authorities learned of the attacks. Former U.S. President Bill Clinton is believed to be bunkered down inside, but authorities have refused to confirm he's still there, saying that would be a security risk. But police and guards remain on patrol. There's also a 16-kilometre air exclusion zone in place around the resort town. The Australian government's not taking any chances over security. Attorney General Darrell Williams was in Port Douglas. We've taken the precaution of upgrading security in relation to um, buildings occupied by uh, American, Israeli and Jewish uh, groups. Yesterday, Bill Clinton was enjoying his holiday, relaxed and mingling with tourists and staff. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. There's been no sign of Mr Clinton today. He was due to leave for Taiwan, but has delayed his public speaking trip. Kathy Wise, 7 News. Queensland specialist search and rescue firefighters are on standby, ready in case they're called to assist the massive rescue effort when the dust begins to clear on Manhattan Island. If they put their people in there to try and find people, uh, they've got a good chance of losing more of their rescuers. Gary Littlewood helped coordinate the Threadbow Rescue in 1997. He now leads a small band of Queensland firefighters who've been training for a tragedy just like this one during Chogham. The work is hot, dusty and cramped rescuers often working in spaces not much bigger than themselves. Rescue team working, can you hear me? It's dangerous and painstaking. One wrong move could cost the life of a survivor or rescuers. If the United States does want our help, the Queensland rescuers can be America bound in eight hours. With all those people, I think they can pretty well handle it. But if they, they ask for help, um, we could help them out in some way. Michael Coombs, 7 News. With the terrible loss has come some amazing tales of survival. A Queenslander who'd been at an economics conference breakfast at the World Trade Centre is one such story. And Rory Robertson joins me now. Rory, can you tell us in your own words what happened? Well, we're just having a you know, routine economics conference uh, breakfast as a speaker speaking. There was a noise. We were on the ground floor of the World Trade Centre, the first tower that was hit by the first plane, although we didn't know it at the time. There was there was a noise. There was the building shook a little. Uh, we all looked at each other. Um, in my mind, at least, I was thinking earthquake. A lot of floors above me like to get out. The building shook again. No one said anything. Everyone ran for the door and ultimately ran for the uh, the floor of the hotel. We were, I guess, extraordinarily lucky in that we were on the ground floor, and so we had almost immediate access to the front doors. When we got there, um, the hotel officials were saying, don't go outside, there's a lot of debris coming down, so we waited around. I recalled on the way past uh, the lift well that there was smoke and dust coming out of the lift, and so my thoughts went from earthquake to maybe a bomb, but no one really had any idea what was happening. Everyone was pretty calm. Mm. People were let outside after about five minutes. We, you know, just People went the same way. I went across the road, maybe 100, 150 yards away, and looked up in, in awe at the, the sort of massive hole. Uh, that person's not had any idea. Someone said it was a missile. Someone said it was a helicopter. So you were three between the accident. 
so deliberate. And Rory, how long was it before the enormity of what had actually occurred uh, began to sink in? Well, as I said, uh, people were looking up, wondering what had happened, and at that stage, you know, first 10 or 15 minutes, no one had any... Con I still had no concrete idea of what had happened. I knew something bad had happened. I didn't know whether it was accidental or deliberate. I started moving away from the area. I spoke to a couple of people on the phone, and I started moving away from the area and noticed you know, a lot of debris on the ground from the first explosion of the plane. I noticed a, a, a car that had basically been cut in half somehow, and there was an, what seemed to be an engine on the ground, and someone I was, I went past I said, what's that? And they said, they were touching, and they said, it's, it's an engine from the plane. And I had no idea. But suddenly the second plane appeared immediately overhead, maybe 150 yards up. And in my mind at that moment, I knew that that plane was going into the other building. And I didn't watch, I just ran. I ran for the nearest cover, which turned out to be an alleyway um, where there was you know, 100 yards of wall above me that would stop any of the potential debris coming over my... Um, I was terrified. Okay, speaking with one-time Queenslander Rory Robertson. Well, New Yorkers are perhaps the most confident people on earth, but they have been shattered by this attack. A look now at how this tragedy has affected some individuals in a city of eight million people. Mighty World Trade Center tumbling down. No, no! Oh my God! Everyday New Yorkers had to run for their lives. How fragile the city seemed today. We deployed a team of Dateline staffers to bring us images of a city under siege on handheld digital cameras. What I saw today on the streets of Manhattan really were, were the extremes of New York. It, it's the best and the worst of people. I got uh, 20 blocks away when the smell and the taste really hit me. Way in the distance, the huge cloud on the horizon, but I could taste and smell something that, that was like the worst electrical fire ever imaginable. They brought us a startling glimpse of what it was like to be at ground zero of a major terrorist attack. What's it like down there? First, get away, then get home. Businesses were closed and buildings evacuated. Thousands upon thousands were left to negotiate a maze of closed streets and suspended services. sense of panic on the streets among the tens of thousands of uh, pedestrians and it was easy to see why look to the horizon on the south and you see an enormous gray black cloud from the explosion as they moved toward safety uptown people tried to keep up with the flurry of events any way they could even the wounded walked this woman was on the 19th floor of the World Trade Center when the first explosion hit hurt but lucky to get out before the building collapsed. We found her 30 blocks north, heading to Bellevue Medical Center. A huge cloud of gray, sorry, huge cloud of gray came and everyone started running and stampeding and everyone was falling on the ground. And um, I don't know like what knocked me over. I don't know if it was a person or just the force of the wind. But I fell down, I just covered my head. I prayed that a building would fall. Doctors and medical students lined up like extras on the set of a disaster movie. Almost immediately after the attack, along with all three major airports, the city's subways, bridges, tunnels, and major highways were all closed. The FDR Drive, normally a winding snarl of congested traffic, empty. Thousands of commuters from New York's outer boroughs were left stranded in Manhattan. By mid-afternoon, a police officer on the scene estimated that more than 20,000 people had crossed the 59th Street Bridge on foot. Meanwhile, Grand Central Station was jammed. But the trains were running until noon.
I remember standing in Grand Central and, and watching a, a man and a woman just scream and, and embrace each other and, and feel relief. I felt their relief to see each other again. After people had been managing to get out for about 15 minutes, all of a sudden they announced that they were evacuating the building um, and people were ordered to get out immediately and workers in their orange vests were running for the exits and we didn't know what was going on. We just ran with them. Confused passengers poured out of the building after a bomb threat. It hit me that this building really could blow up and um, I, I was scared. I was, I was afraid that the, the building literally could blow up underneath my feet. All around the city it was a mass migration of hundreds of thousands of people but uncannily quiet. Perhaps it was the unspeakable horrors many had seen. It was orderly, but it was chaotic. People were shocked. Everyone was dazed. Uh, people didn't really want to look each other in the eye, I think, for fear of breaking down. The question on everybody's lips seemed to be, what is going on, and is there more of it that's going to come? This was supposed to be election day in New York. As if anyone took note, it was officially pulled off. Everything was. What was open was tightly locked down. What's that? Can't be doing no pictures. Okay, it's NBC My point, News. I don't you understand. It's NBC News. I don't care who it is. Security at all buildings that might be targets was extremely tight. Our own building, the famous tourist destination at Rockefeller Plaza, was evacuated, but for NBC's news operations to bring you this story. And all over Manhattan, there was this strange sort of gridlock. The uptown avenues in Manhattan have been turned into virtual parking lots as everyone tries to flee northward. Meanwhile, the downtown avenues have all been sealed off but for emergency vehicles. Cell phone service came and went. Anxious people called their loved ones the old-fashioned way. Sometimes that didn't work either. People were forced to use pay phones, which is kind of a joke in Manhattan because it's hard to find a pay phone that works. The only thing that was easy today was getting lost in the scramble. She doesn't have a cell phone. They don't work anyway. She, she is not mobile because she's got emphysema and she can't walk very fast. David Douglas's 64-year-old mother lives in an apartment building just four blocks from the World Trade Center. Soon after the attack, she had chest pains. So he flagged a passing car and the driver headed for the nearest hospital. But I said, look, lady, please, my mom can't walk. Please, if you, please just take her north as much as she can, because she can't breathe well. He tried to follow on his rollerblades, but lost track of the car and spent the rest of the day searching hospitals. So I just want to know, is there any, is there any system of finding people with... Well, they, they're doing the best, we're doing the best we can. It's, it's pretty chaotic. He searched family reunion centers. Uh, Lucille Lovato. Uh, a B A T O, and even Dave. public schools desperate to find his mother. Are there any people being kept here? Finally, after four hours of futile searching, he called home. There was a message on his answering machine. It's my mom. She was safe, staying with a friend in his very own apartment building. She's in my building. For two New Yorkers, a small moment of comfort in a day when so many others will find none. And as we mentioned earlier, a special hotline has been set up for Australians concerned about friends or relatives in the United States. The numbers to call again, 1-800-002-214 or 1300-555-135. Everyone is urged to be patient and to persevere with those numbers. Thanks, Kay. Well, our coverage continues in just a few moments in 7 News and then throughout the night, so please stay with us.
say to our American friends who we love and admire so much, we really feel for you. is being tested but make no mistake we will show the world that we will pass this test